Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. My name is Suzanne Walker. I am the supervisor for the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. Thank you guys so much for being with us today. I'm really excited to have Franny Gady here with us today to speak about internet privacy and defending it at work and home. And I wanted to mention that Franny is the scholarly communication librarian at Butler University. So welcome, welcome. Um, I do have to start out today with a few announcements. The webinar is provided as part of the Topics and Academic Libraries series. Uh, to register for other webinars available for this series or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, go ahead and go to the Indiana State Library's event calendar, which is on our website at library.im.gov under Services for Libraries. You can also find a full list of our current in-person training menu um, as well, and you can also visit our continuing education website. So the Indiana State Library has many ways that we try to stay connected to library staff across the state for weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state. Please subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word, and I hope a lot of you are already getting that. We also offer a blog at the ISL that provides information about our collection, interview spotlights on library staff from across the state, and information about upcoming events at the State Library. If you are having sound issues during the webinar, please see the sound issues box just below your chat box. If there's a global sound issue, we will announce it in the chat box. If you are unable to resolve the sound issue you are experiencing, we are recording this meeting and you can watch it offline after the meeting has ended. Again, if there is a global sound issue, we will make an announcement in the chat box, and at this time, we are not experiencing any global sound issues. Today's webinar will be archived and will be available to access and share on the State Library's archived trainings page. And I also wanted to mention that your LEU is going to be available for download at the end of the webinar. So if you are a librarian that needs LEUs, you'll be able to download that immediately after the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Franny. She's going to tell us a little bit about what a scholarly communication librarian does, and then she's going to get started with her presentation. Thanks, Franny. Right. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I wanted to start off today just uh, kind of explaining who I am and why I'm here. Um, internet privacy isn't necessarily something that I deal with in my day-to-day -day life as a scholarly communication librarian. Um, I manage an institutional repository for Butler University that's the, uh, the scholarly and creative output of the institution to make that freely and openly available uh, on the web. I, I consider that kind of a, a contribution, a social justice issue, really, um, to, to make our scholarly work more freely available. Um, I also do a lot of work in digital scholarship and the digital humanities. Uh, and then I have, you know, a, a number of related interests, including data management. Um, and, and with that comes sort of this interest in, um, you know, in big data and what that means and also the privacy issues that come with it. And so this is sort of a, a pet project of mine and um, I'm by no means a privacy expert. Um, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the regulation that's been in the news recently. Um, talk a little bit about uh, you know what we can generally do uh, about privacy and then sort of some uh, technological fixes, some different tools that we can use, things that you can use in your personal life that you can pass on to patrons, um, kind of things that you can think about uh, to bring back to your libraries too. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. And everyone, I just wanted to mention, if you have any questions for Franny, please go ahead and type them in the chat box as we go along. And Franny and I talked, and I'll probably just interrupt her and uh, let her know your questions so we can kind of have a discussion throughout the webinar. Absolutely. So yeah, please do feel free um, any questions throughout the webinar. So I just wanted to start out with uh, this statement from the American Library Association affirming that the rights of privacy are necessary for intellectual freedom and are fundamental to the ethics and practice of librarianship. I don't think that there are too many of us who, who would, uh, you know, would argue with that, but I know there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people who uh, don't necessarily agree or um, think of privacy as an issue. And one of the things that you hear a lot of times 
and particularly out of the UK recently, is that if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. And so this is an argument that gets tossed around a lot um, and is kind of uh, difficult to negotiate. Um, and I'm not really going to address this here uh, in my presentation today, uh, but I did want to gesture to a couple resources if this is something that you're interested in exploring further. Um, I will be making the slides available, and this is all heavily hyperlinked, so anytime you see something that's underlined, that's actually a link out to something specific. Um, so one of my favorite commentators on the issue of nothing to hide, nothing to fear, is uh, Professor Daniel Solov of uh, George Washington University Law School. Um, if you do have access to the Chronicle of Higher Education, um, I would highly recommend uh, reading the piece that I have linked here. Um, it does a really great job of being sort of readable and informative and will help you kind of guide discussions about privacy. Um, the free SSRN article that's linked um, is more academic in tone and is significantly longer, but it does touch on the same issues. Um, but ultimately, the idea here is that it's not just about nothing to hide. Um, everybody, everybody has things that they want to keep private. You know, that's kind of what curtains and doors are all about. Um, but it's more to do with what data is being collected and what's being done with it. Um, so much of our data um, just, you know, goes into black boxes that we can't control, that we don't know what's being done with it, we don't know what it's being used for. Uh, you may have heard in the news a little while ago about a woman who started receiving advertising for baby-related things from Target uh, before she even knew that she was pregnant. Um, so th there's some questions about what could the government do with large amounts of data? What could insurers do with that kind of data? How safe is that data? We've seen, you know, major leaks from all over the country from government to corporations. Um, what if you know, someone else got the ha their hands on the data that's being collected? Um, and you know, what if the results that are being drawn from that data are incorrect, like we've seen sometimes with the do not fly list? Um, so it's important that we know what's being collected, what's being done with it, and how it's being stored. So uh, why, why are we having this webinar now? Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, privacy is not, um, I'm not an expert in it, but it's an issue that I'm really passionate about. Um, and so I came to do this webinar after uh, spilling a lot of digital ink, as it were, uh, discussing Senate Joint Resolution 34, uh, which is a SJ Res 34 here. Um, and the link here will take you out to the government site that actually has the text of what this was. Um, and so, you know, how we should think about this um, and how to deal with it. So um, a little context to the name here of the overturning the FCC regulation, protecting the privacy of customers of broadband and other telecommunications services. Um, so this is an FCC regulation, uh, not an FTC regulation. So this is the Federal Communications Commission. Um, and so this is a change that occurred during the Obama administration uh, when ISPs were designated common carriers uh, like uh, telephone companies um, and then therefore came under FCC control where they'd been under FTC control in the past. So. Um, the repealed FCC regulation wasn't actually set to go into effect until later this year, until December of 2017. So nothing has technically changed. However, this is kind of part of a larger push by current administration towards deregulation. Um, and the next issue that I think we're really going to want to be paying attention to um, is net neutrality, uh, which has overlap uh, with internet privacy issues in, in many ways, but I'm not actually going to be getting into that today, so next time. Mm -hmm. um, so ISPs are currently allowed to sell customer data uh, to advertisers, and the repealed regulation would have required them uh, to seek permission. So there is nothing stopping ISPs from selling customer data. Um, and so this regulation would have introduced um, kind of an opt-out to sharing or selling data, or excuse me, an opt-in rather than an opt-out. Currently, uh, we're in an opt-out system. So um, opt-in systems, as we've probably all encountered, um, don't get nearly the sort of uptake. Um, you know, just as most people won't bother to take the time to opt out of a program, uh, few people would take time to opt in. So uh, this means significantly less data uh, for sale. 
Um, and so ISPs want to sell this data uh, to provide a revenue stream uh, equal to those generated by Google, Facebook, and other internet services. And a lot of ISP lobbyists, uh, you know, during the point when this was being discussed, uh, were arguing that, you know, Google and Facebook and all of these uh, internet provider, not internet providers rather, but uh, internet platforms um, can do this and we can't and it's not competitive and we're being deprived of this revenue stream that other people have. There's no reason that we shouldn't have this too. So that was, that was a big part of the argument there. Um, so going forward, uh, it's going to be really important to keep an eye on your ISP's privacy policy. Um, right now, most ISPs don't have provisions um, in their policies to start selling this data. Um, so it's going to be important to keep an eye out for updates as they start to make these changes. So as I said before, nothing's really changing with the repeal of this regulation, um, but things may start changing in the future. So one of the ways to keep up to date with this uh, would be to create a Google alert uh, for your ISP name and privacy to see when that gets updated. There are a number of watchdog groups that keep an eye on, particularly for the major carriers, uh, Comcast, AT&T, et cetera, to when there are changes to that privacy policy, you're going to be hearing about it. But this is one way to make sure uh, that you know what's happening and changing. So what's currently for sale? Well, nothing yet. But ultimately, what this deregulation means is that ISPs may offer anonymized browser history data to third parties. So currently, uh, many ISPs have their own advertising network, and they're already serving targeted ads uh, based on user browser history data. Um, previously, AT&T had a program where um, people with fiber optic cable had to pay an extra $30 to opt out of personal ads that were based on their internet traffic. Uh, that program was shut down after people found out about it, but there's definitely a history of things like this being done. Um, particularly the, the fee there was something that, a lot of, that raised a lot of eyebrows, but yeah, with, with an opt out program here. So what's not for sale? Unfortunately, um, your congressional representative's browser history and your personal individual browser history are not for sale. So you may have seen um, some crowdfunding efforts right around the time that this um, regulate, deregulation was being tossed around and before it passed um, to try and purchase uh, the browser histories of congressional and government representatives, um, I want to say that north of $100,000 was raised for this purpose. Um, uh, however, uh, you know, while it's, while it's good to see, you know, people's consciousness being raised on the issue, uh, they're not as good as 2018 midterm turnout would be, um, you know, this sort of fundraising was ultimately in vain. Um, individual browser histories are not for sale. The data that would be collected under a program like this would be aggregated and anonymized. Um, but I don't know if you're familiar with, um, in about 2006, I want to say, uh, AOL released a bucket load of search data uh, from uh, AOL customers. So it was like their entire search history. And it was completely, well, it's theoretically anonymized. Um, but once people started breaking down what their searches were, um, it was actually fairly easy to uh, de-anonymize people and figure out who it was uh, that was doing the searching. There's um, actually some really interesting work that was done afterwards. I think somebody made a play about one of the anonymized uh, searchers there using their search history as like the plot for the play. So, um, but again, that, that anonymized data, there's been a lot of work done in the area of, you know, it doesn't take very much to piece together someone's identity. I think it, it takes your, uh, your birthday and your zip code and trying to remember what the last piece is, but it, it, it's, you know, three pieces of data and someone can figure out who you are. So, Franny, this is so interesting to me. So if someone was trying to figure out, um, could they isolate down to, like, the computer that that person is using, do you know? Like, if they, for example, I'm probably the only one at the State Library that searches for uh, stuff on Ukrainian egg decoration during my lunch hour, but if someone knew that about me, could they then be able to isolate all of my all of my searches and pull that out. Potentially. It yeah. depends on what de-anonymization techniques were used to kind of strip out that information. But potentially, and your ISP already has that data. So it's just a matter of there. what they're going to do, do with it. it. Right. Yes. Very fascinating. Um, 
So uh, one of the few voices I've heard with, uh, you know, speaking with some optimism um, about the, the continued deregulation here is uh, Daniel Sullivan, who I mentioned earlier, um, who suggested that in the absence of the FTC um, and FCC regulation, um, we're going to see both uh, the EU and individual states kind of step up to the plate, um, particularly paying attention to California and what's done out there. Um, interestingly, Minnesota was the first to bring up the possibility of passing their own internet privacy legislation after um, the Senate Joint Resolution 34 was uh, signed into law. And it was added as an amendment to their state budget, um, but with a narrow majority in their House of Representatives, it was dropped during negotiations for the state budget there. But I mean, that was pretty much immediately after this um, resolution was passed. Um, so that would be an area to definitely keep an eye on um, in terms of uh, regulation. So um, getting started with internet privacy, I wanted to start first by talking a little bit um, about uh, reading contracts. And so this is, I think, one of the important ways we can help, you know, protect our own, but also our users and their privacy. Um, and is, it's really important to read kind of the contracts that we sign carefully. And those contracts in, include kind of terms of service. Um, the site that I've linked here, TOSDR, is a play on TLDR, too long, didn't read. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's, that's what that site goes to. And it's not... Um, kept up to date, and obviously it's not legal advice, but it does break down the terms of service for a number of different platforms to explain, you know, what some of that legalese actually means when you're when you're signing this here. You know, um, you know, these platforms are ones that, you know, we use as a library that we encourage our users to agree to when we help them sign up for their email accounts. Um, you know, there has to be a balance somewhere between, you know, data-driven services to give people what they want um, and privacy. And, you know, I think we're all going to continue to walk that very fine line. Um, and when you think about signing contracts, I mean, I, I feel like there are some weeks that go by that it's, there's, there's hardly a day that goes by where you don't agree to some you know, some privacy agreement at, or, you know, you click here so that you can move on to the next step to get whatever it is that you're trying to get. And I never read those things, you know? No, and I mean, who has time to? Again, with the with too long, didn't read. Exactly, um, especially when there's something on the other side of it that you, you know, like, I need this download. I'm Okay, I agree. Give it to me, you know? And, and that's something that I, I'll talk a little bit more about at the end, okay. too. Um, so, you know, another way when you're getting started with privacy group, uh, with privacy is to support privacy groups, um, to take a look at some of the information made available by these privacy groups, um, particularly. So I um, pointed out the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and the ACLU, both those groups who are doing work in this area. But I also really wanted to draw your attention to uh, the Library Freedom Project. Um, and this is a, an amazing set of resources um, that have been assembled for libraries of all types um, for both librarians and to help pay, uh, to help users. Um, they will also come out and do workshops at your library to teach your users some of the top, uh, about some of the things that we're going to continue to talk about here today. Um, so they would actually come and do workshops with your patrons, with your patrons, or with you. Um, with you. Okay, yes, you yep, they do. Staff. They do both of those, both of those sorts of things. Right. So by no means do I think that uh, technology is necessarily the answer after all, right? It's gotten into in, uh, gotten us into some of these issues. Um, but uh, for what it's worth, there are some things that we can do with technology um, to help protect our privacy and also kind of advice that we can give to others um, who are interested in protecting their privacy as well. So. Um, Ultimately, with, with, uh, when you're trying to protect your data from your ISP, it's all about encryption. Mm. Uh, so the, the first big thing that everybody really should do, it's 
super straightforward and easy to do is to install HTTPS everywhere. Um, and so this was a, a plugin for your browser, an extension for your browser that was developed by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And what it does is it forces encrypted connections where they're available. So if you ever look um, in your browser window and you see the HTTP colon slash slash, um, it, what it does is it forces a secure connection. So it adds the S on there wherever that's available. And a lot of sites actually do have that available. It also forces anything else in the page that can potentially make an encrypted or secure connection to make that connection. So it actually goes in and rewrites your browser request, basically. So it's, it's really effective. It can slow down page load times. And again, that's one of the, one of the trade-offs here. Um, but uh, a number of extensions will do that as well. So I'll, I'll try and draw your attention to where that can sometimes be an issue. Um, so the second piece about um, encryption is a VPN, and a VPN stands for a virtual private network. Um, and this is basically the number one way. This is the big thing that you can do if you are concerned about your ISP uh, using your browser history data for whatever purpose is to have a VPN. And what that does um, is it masks your traffic so your ISP can no longer see where it is that you're going or what you're doing. And the websites that you visit don't have your IP address. They don't have any personally identifying uh, information from you anymore except for um, some of the uh, advertising tracker systems. And we'll talk about those a little bit in a moment. Um, but a VPN really is, this is, this is the big one. Um, and if this is something you're concerned about. Um, and what does that stand for again? <laughs> it is a virtual private network. Great. So it's. Um, Generally, there, there are servers that are located all over the United States and all over the world um, that mask where it is that your internet traffic is coming from. Um, so one of the big VPNs that has gotten a lot of attention recently is um, actually built into the Opera web browser. Um, and it's free. And it's very easy to use. It's basically just a little ticky button to say, yes, I want to use this VPN. Um, however, um, there, there's some caution with this. That first, Opera um, as a browser is owned by a Chinese multinational, and the VPN uh, technology that they purchased um, to use in the browser was also developed um, externally to the company too. So. Again, it's sort of who do you put your trust in there, um, but it is a very easy tool. And you know, if your primary concern here is with your ISP and your browser data, then that might be a good solution for you. However, those VPNs can run fairly slow, again, because they're free and they're used widely. Um, a good, reliable VPN is going to be one that you pay for. Um, and that's why a lot of times you'll hear this uh, a VPN referred to as a privacy tax is that this is something that's now required because our ISPs want our browser history data, and now you're paying a privacy tax by purchasing kind of this add-on uh, VPN to protect that data. Um, so I, uh, I, I do have a couple links at the end that talk about how to select uh, a good VPN. Um, there are uh, you know, a number of different um, kind of criteria that may go into selecting one. Um, a lot of times people don't think that having one that's based in the United States is a good idea because of the um, uh, regulations surrounding who can get access to that VPN data. So that's something to pay attention to. And there are, I do have some links about how to select a VPN. Um, and one note is that if, if you do have a VPN, um, you can't use Netflix. So you will have to disable your VPN to use Netflix. They have uh, blocked that functionality. So what does that say about Netflix? That's, well, that's a good <laughs> or is, question. Or is that, so, or is that uh, I don't know. Yeah, so I, you know, I actually I, I tweeted at them and I asked them, you know, you know with this um, deregulation happening, is this something that you know, you're going to reconsider? Because it's actually a fairly recent phenomenon there, blocking the mm -hmm. VPNs there. And w the reason that they've done it is that they have the, the licensing agreements that they strike with the various uh, movie and TV media companies mm -hmm. um, are geographically restricted. And so people were using VPNs to get access to content that was available in other countries. I see. So it's almost like that's how they authenticate their users or whatever. Exactly, okay. yes. 
So, and even if it's a, uh, you know, a local VPN, you know, say Chicago or something like that, just because it's within your same United States, it recognizes that there's a VPN in play and it won't make that connection. Interesting. All right, so, um, so the next piece that I wanted to talk about is uh, Tor, which is, um, <laughs> which is, uh, it stands for, oh gosh, uh, the Onion Relay. I, someone's going to have to correct me on that. Um, but what it is, so this is a uh, um, just a quote from the blog Lifehacker discussing what Tor is. So it disguises your identity by moving your traffic across different Tor servers and encrypting that traffic so it isn't traced back to you. So anybody who tries to um, see the traffic coming from the nodes on the Tor network rather than your computer. So it, it would, um, it, it functions in many of the same way as a VPN, except it adds additional layers of security. So it, um, every time someone tries to trace it back, it just stops at one of the layers there. Um, so using Tor um, is largely based on using a Tor browser. Um, this is something that can be downloaded um, for free for Mac, PC, and Linux. Um, a lot of we have an answer, the Onion Router. Router, thank you, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, no, thank you. Uh, that was going to drive me nuts. I'm sitting here going, oh, man, what's R stand for? Um, man, too, too many acronyms out there. We'll just call it TOR. Um, and so this is something that can be installed on your computer. Um, and it, it uh, in combination with a VPN, basically an unbeatable combo, although there has been um, some, uh, some work that's been done on the part of, say, law enforcement that it is not um, completely unbeatable and Tor does have a reputation for being a haven for some more unsavory things on the internet. However, they're absolutely, just like with a VPN, um, you know, some people consider a VPN, well, this is, you know, this is the, it gets back to the nothing to hide, nothing right. to fear argument, right? Yeah. That, well, you don't, you don't need a VPN, you know, it, if you're going to be, you know, torrenting or downloading things illegally, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's the only reason you might need a VPN and that's really not the case. Um, and it's much the same thing with Tors. There are absolutely valid reasons for using Tor, um, and it doesn't save your browser history as you're using this here. Um, so just like with HTTPS everywhere that slows down everything a little bit with Tor, there are a couple things you need to keep in mind. Is first, that it will break some of the internet in that no flash um, you, you can't use Flash within the Tor browser or RealPlayer or QuickTime. It's also impossible to use BitTorrent. I think another thing that gets a bad rap, there are plenty of good uses for BitTorrent, um, but it, it will break um, those particular plugins. And if you activate them, then you're losing a lot of the um, functionality and privacy protection that Tor offers. Um, same thing with downloading documents. Um, so anything that you download in the Tor browser, um, opening them if you're connected to the internet will reveal your non-Tor um, IP address. So that's just one thing that if you're using this um, for this purpose, um, opening documents is not something that you'll want to that you'll want to do. If you disconnect from the internet before opening the document, that would be one way to avoid revealing your IP address there. So many things to think about, Franny. <laughs> um, all right. So um, the next three are browser extensions here. Um, and they there is some overlap between what these things do. Uh, between uBlock Origin, this is the kind of ad blocker of choice and one of the most lightweight, but also really robust. Um, it makes it really easy to white and blacklist certain, advertise, uh, certain advertisements and advertising networks. And then similarly is Privacy Badger. So um, whereas uBlock Origin is more blocking your ads, Privacy Badger is focused on opting you out of various third-party tracking networks that exist on the web. So like when you go to Amazon and you look at that really cute polka dot dress and then it shows up for you later on at Facebook. Facebook. Yes. yes. It's like they've got me pegged, man. Um, but th those are the sorts of networks that Privacy Badger actively opts you out of. So th those tra uh, those tracking networks just don't load on pages. And Privacy Badger is another EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, plugin. And that that's another 
really important bit about privacy too is the more um, extensions and plugins and things that you have installed, the more people that you're potentially giving access to your data. So that's one thing to pay attention is, you know, who's developing these? Do you trust this person with your data? Do you trust that it's not going to go any further or that mm -hmm. it's not being stored somewhere? Um, and then for uh, expert mode um, are uh, script blockers. And so using these can break your browser. Um, if you just install one of these and expect it to work out of the box, um, every site on the modern web that you go to is going to break. Um, but with a little bit of research, these can actually be set up um, to prevent some really intrusive ads from appearing. Um, scripts are really good at kind of stealing data. Um, so we mentioned Flash on the previous slide, and so that's one thing in particular that it will help block um, is Flash, but sometimes Flash content is necessary. So, so that, was, that was sort of my expert mode there, and if that's mm -hmm. something that people want to talk about, there's also tons of guides online on how to set up a NoScript or Umatrix, which is actually the same um, developer as uBlock, so both of those are by the same person. Yeah. Um, so another question that I uh, see a lot about privacy is, you know, how to make your email private. Um, there really aren't secure email services available in the United States uh, just because of the way that our, that our regulation works. So for people who are particularly concerned about email privacy, um, email encryption is really the way to go. Um, and I've included a couple links at the end that talk about how do you get started with doing email encryption and that can actually be done in a number of uh, different platforms and services. Um, and so for your phone, um, you know, this is one area where, you know, this has come up in the news a lot recently, too, is, you know, people who've had encrypted phones um, and, and, you know, having the government ask them, ask uh, both Google and Apple to, you know, unlock. unlock those, yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, um, so in the links here, I have um, kind of step-by-step -step guides on how to encrypt your phone, whether you have an, uh, an Apple or Android uh, device. A number of VPNs also have mobile apps, which is really great if you like using, um, say, Wi-Fi instead of your data plan. Um, also, the cell phone carriers have not been um, absent from this discussion of um, browser history. In fact, I want to say it was Verizon uh, who had a uh, had basically a keylogger where they were gathering people's browser histories just every everywhere that they were going to and just kind of keeping them in a box there. So, um, you know, when that was discovered, there was kind of a big outcry about it. So it's not just your ISP, but it's also your cellular provider. So, um, and then there's furthermore, if you're in, you know, a coffee shop or a public place and want to uh, protect your device from being on the unsecured Wi-Fi, um, your VPN can also handle that. So um, a lot of VPNs have um, kind of, you know, a number of devices that you can use it on, um, and so that's one way to use that. Um, can I ask you what? It's probably a, I don't know, it's a dumb question. <laughs> no such thing. So is, um, is your data plan, if you're on your data versus being on your Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. is your data plan more secure? Or Not necessarily. It, it, it depends. depends. Okay. Yep. It really okay. depends on what the privacy policy is for your cellular for provider. Okay. And pretty much all of the major cellular providers at one point or another have been caught doing things with, with user data. data. In, yeah. in so I guess it depends on who you're protecting it from. Yes. So. Yes, exactly. Um, and then... Uh, one another uh, kind of way to uh, kind of bring privacy into your daily life um, as an alternative to what's WhatsApp or um, Facebook Messenger is Signal, um, which is available on a number of different platforms. But it's it, it's a really good replacement actually for for both of those and has a number of features built in that help protect both your privacy and the privacy of the people that you're speaking to. Um, and it also has a voice chat component in addition to um, kind of text messaging. So, um, you know, I've, I've just spent a lot of time talking about tools because that's one really easy way to get a grasp on it. Um, but it, it really is less about the tools and sort of more what your concerns are. Um, you know, what's, what's negotiable for you? What services do you need in your life? Um, you know, some people 
have to be on Facebook. Some people have to use Google. Um, you, you can't opt out of that. And so um, what tools you select and how you approach privacy issues are very much going to be, you know, what is it that you're concerned about? Um, you know, what, what are the issues that are important to you? I actually have an example of this the other day. Um, so there is this amazing service called Unroll It. And before you go sign up for it, you got to hear the rest of my story. Um, and what it does is it hooks into your email account and it figures out all of the stuff that you get from stores and your list serves and all of the things that just like clutter up your inbox on a daily basis. And it sucks them all together and every day you just get a single email that has all of that stuff just in one email that you get to scroll through each day. So you don't have to unsubscribe. You can still stay subscribed to all of that. Check out the coupons when you have a minute. You can just kind of scroll through and take a look at it. It was an amazing product. I love this. But then it occurs to me, like, you've just given this product complete access to your email. It knows precisely what you are subscribed to. And another feature of it is that it helps you unsubscribe to things that you don't want to be subscribed to anymore. And then they sell that data back to the people who you were unsubscribing from to let them know like when this happened, when this is going on. So it's, you know, privacy is not their goal there. And I, I think it gets back to the, um, and I, I don't believe this is true in all of the cases, but the, you know, if you're not paying for it, you're the product. Um, and so that's one thing to look at with the tools. And so you know, this thing was amazing. It uncluttered my inbox. I spent significantly less time looking at my email. On the other hand, they're really not respecting my privacy yeah, as a no, user. Is that something about that, you? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So that that's kind of the trade-offs there. And and this is um, something that if um, you start to dig into privacy community a little bit, is look is looking at kind of your threat model. Um, is like what do you see as a problem and what do you want to prevent happening there? So hopefully some of these tools will give you a good place to start on that. Um, my last slide here is a bunch of further reading and these will be made available like immediately afterwards to um, kind of start digging through. Um, but especially as you get towards the bottom um, are uh, mostly like uh, resource sets um, in addition to sort of news coverage of the various issues we talked about here. So, um, so that's what I have for you today. I'd love to take your questions. Awesome. So if anyone has questions or things they want to discuss, please go ahead and throw them in uh, the chat box. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for being here and talking to us about all of us, Franny. So from hearing your presentation, it strikes me like I really feel like I need to be a lot smarter about this than I currently am. <laughs> and I also feel like I'm not a dumb person, you know, like it seems I'm a librarian. I'm cognizant about a lot of this and I understand the importance of privacy and I understand the importance of protecting you know my patrons privacy and things like that but it seems like you almost have to have some sort of a degree to be able to to put some of these things in place and it's yeah kind of piecing out all of that and so and a number of the resources there are actually built around being kind of toolkits which I think is something that we're particularly familiar with employing and you know finding certain areas where it's like yeah you know it wouldn't actually be um, a big deal for me to install you know a couple things on my browser extension to make it more secure um, and that that actually makes a fairly significant difference um, and, and that it doesn't need to be an all or nothing uh, proposition too is something that we can work towards. Okay, so we have a couple of questions coming in on the chat. Um, could other services do what Netflix does with the VPNs to make them useless? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I think that would probably be located in some of the contracts um, that we've signed. Um, you know, it, we see, uh, you can actually see a lot of relationship between VPNs and proxies, and I think that's something that we all have a fair bit of familiarity with, too, um, you know, functioning in a, in a similar way. So, but yeah, ap that's absolutely possible um, that, that other services will go about doing that. I want to say the BBC iPlayer also did something similar um, to prevent people from, from accessing that content. Wow. Um, we have a couple other questions coming in. I have more things on my list. Um, what about things like protection from viruses? So whenever I think of like protecting my computer, I think about things like McAfee and Norton and things like that. But that's mm -hmm. different, right? That's not the same as protecting your privacy. Necessarily. Not, not necessarily. I think it's kind of all, all part of a of a like personal security mindset that would go into it. But that wasn't something that I was necessarily sure, yeah. trying to yeah. address here. Yeah. But um, could definitely put together um, that there are um, some antivirus programs that are more effective than others. Um, and firewalls also are 
have another thumb. Yeah, yeah, have you know is more of a sense of security than actual security, depending on what the threat is. So, okay. um, yeah, there are a number of areas there that um, can definitely relate to privacy. Um, we have another question. How is the way that ISPs, the way that they use our data, how is that different from the way that Google uses it? It's it's very much the same. The same. Yes. Okay. So this is uh, very much an extension of what's already being done with our data by the number of services that we already um, subscribe to. But the different the big difference between them is that we can say, nope, I'm giving up Google. I'm giving up Facebook and opt out. We may not want to, but that is possible. But in a lot of places, your ISP is your ISP. I can't, I can't change my ISP. I am stuck with the one that I have right mm -hmm. now. And so yeah. if they choose to start using my data, I can't say, well, that's unacceptable to me and I'm going to go somewhere else. I just have to live with it. Because a lot of times an ISP is your internet service provider. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that provider in the area that you live in, there might just be one. Yes. Isn't that yep. right? Yes. OK. All right. That's interesting. Another thing I wanted to mention, and feel free to continue questions or discussion points. Um, we certainly want to hear from you guys. I was thinking about how, and I don't know how it is in other countries, but Americans, we love data. We track all kinds of things all the time. Everybody has apps on their phones to track various things. I use a running app, you know, but lots of people have Fitbits. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about privacy in those at all? Do you, are you yes, aware? Sir. <laughs> It's it's interesting with, with the, the quantified self movement, and I, I think there are some definite privacy concerns. I don't know specifically what Fitbit's um, kind of privacy policy is right. for those sorts of things. Um, and I, I think one of my major concerns is that, you know, you get a Fitbit, you can use this, and, you know, if you hurt the, hit these certain levels, we'll, you know, discount your insurance. Or, you know, when it starts getting plugged into different systems mm -hmm. is when I start getting nervous about that data being mm -hmm. shared. You know, it's one thing for it to live in you know a particular server belonging to this particular company when you know what you're going to do with it but once it starts making its way out and connecting into the other systems mm -hmm. which can do some really interesting things but it can also provide some opportunities for you know really sort of scary or welling stuff that we don't necessarily want to get into i guess that's true um you know on the other hand you know, everyone does want to live a healthy lifestyle, and insurance companies supposedly want us to live a healthy lifestyle, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so, like, I know here at our work, you know, I have a running app, and I have it connected to my thing so that I get points, and, you know, they tell us during training, this is all private. You know, we don't share it with anybody, things like that. But have I read that contract? No. So there's that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, this is really fascinating. <laughs> um, I think that's most of the questions that I had. Does anyone else have any other questions for Franny? And while you guys, um, okay, so we're just getting like a, such an important topic. Patrons have asked me about this often. Thank you so much. So that's great. Any other comments for Franny? Anything else you wanted to add? We're think kind so, of there. No. Okay. All right. But yeah, um, one, one more plug for the uh, the Library Freedom Project. Actually, they they do really good work. Um, and uh, yeah, de definitely take a look at their site. Um, it kind of takes the resources list that I've included there and just nth degree. So Fantastic. just lots of great stuff. So. OK, well, thank you so much, Franny. I'm going to go ahead and put up um, our file share so that people can, I am nervous about it now. Like, <laughs> what's going to happen when you download this? Surely it's fine, right? Um, but I'm going to put that up for people. We are going to go ahead and uh, turn off